Good afternoon, everyone. Let's see. Um, we have uh, one minute. We're about to um, kick off the study session. So um, for everyone in attendance and uh, particularly uh, um, Chair Ontiveros, we got word from, uh, from Commissioner Walters uh, that he is really not feeling well. So we'll avoid the, the HIPAA violation by not uh, talking about um, why he's not feeling well, but he will not be joining us. Um, so unless something miraculous happens within this next hour and a half of study session um, between he and um, Commissioner Williams, um, we will not have a quorum for the public hearing scheduled at 5.30. Um, so, uh, Chair Ontiveros, I see that it's now 4 p.m. Uh, I apologize for um, bringing this information so late, but we just got it. Uh, Mr. McNeely, thank you. And I was aware of this. Okay. Um, I very much appreciate you um, informing the commissioners and other members that are present tonight um, because it is what it is. But it yes. is four o'clock, so why don't we go ahead? We do not need a quorum to have a study session. Okay. So let's go ahead and start the study session. Absolutely. So uh, Chair Ontiveros, if it's okay with you, we could go through the study session uh, to include going through the, um, the department update um, and round table. And then at round table, we could anticipate um, some staff recommendations on when we could postpone uh, tonight's public hearing to, and we have some ideas and some recommendations. And with the commissioners present, it would be good to get everyone's input on that. Does that sound good? Uh, yes, that I that was actually going to be my suggestion. So okay. I am very much on board with that. So yes, let's have the study session and then we will have commission roundtable and come up with a plan. Okay. Well, uh, Chair Ontiveros, if it's okay with you, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show our agenda for study session. Okay, are you, uh, is everyone seeing the, um, the study session agenda? Yes, we are. All right. Well, uh, Chair Tavares, commissioners uh, who made it, um, great to uh, hear everyone again, I wish I could see y'all. Um, I took a little year off and uh, um, am very happy to be back with you. So we can jump into, uh, into the cases as we have on the agenda you see in front of you. These would be one scheduled for next month's regularly scheduled public hearing on Wednesday, October 26th. Mr. McNeely, Mr. Yes. McNeely this is Chair Ontiveros. I, yes, I was gonna ask that everybody please mute and that has happened. So please continue on, thank you. Absolutely. I heard a dog barking and I know it's not where I'm at. So um, yeah, Sorry thank you. For that, guys. <laughs> thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the reminder for muting. Um, and we can all do that. And I, I learned from my coworkers here that the norm has become uh, for better bandwidth for everyone that we all just leave our uh, we all just leave our cameras off. Um, so the uh, the first case that will come to next month's regularly scheduled public hearing is AM 2204. That is the update to the 2001 Dony Park Timberline Fernwood area plan. And uh, as, as recommended um, by, that, uh, by that citizen committee uh, would also include a major amendment to the Coconino County Comprehensive Plan. So on that, um, Melissa Shaw, our long range planner um, will be giving that present, has, it was the project manager for this entire project and uh, we'll be giving the presentation and she can, um, she can discuss some of that with you here this evening. I will stop sharing so she can share. So Melissa? Yep. Okay. Thanks commissioners. Um, I just have a, a short refresher presentation for you. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yep, we can. Oh, okay, so if you recall, um, we had, um, last time we had this on an agenda, uh, we actually had to remove it from an agenda uh, because it was um, determined to be a major amendment. There was a question, we had a, a study session with you back in June 
And at the time there was discussion about um, the area plan committee uh, relooking at one of the policies that was determined to be um, in conflict with the comprehensive plan goals and policies. They have um, um, chosen to leave the policy in the document as written. So that's why this is a major amendment which would be heard at your October hearing. So I'll just go through this very quickly, um, mainly just as a refresher. So again, it's a major amendment. And uh, if you recall, major amendments can be heard once a year by the commission during your specifically October hearing. And here's the map of the planning area. This map actually will be updated because there is an annex, a small 12 acre piece that has been annexed by the city right down here. So just again, the area planning committee has met over 30 times, probably closer to 35 times. And the plan, the new document does contain a vision statement. That old one does not have one. Uh, they've identified new issues and topics. The whole plan has been reorganized. And then there are several new and updated maps, plus it contains an implementation plan. I won't go over this, but this is just the minor amendment criteria. Um, and basically it says that a minor amendment must meet the air comprehensive plans, vision goals and policies. And then for a major amendment, any uh, goal or policy or change to the text that conflicts with or alters one or more of the comprehensive plan goals and policies, that means it goes and jumps into that category. And um, I can read this if you'd like, or just leave them on the screen. So the, um, the area plan draft contains this goal and then policy LU24, which um, in reviewing the comprehensive plan conflicts with this comprehensive plan goal and policy 13. So these will be coming to you next month for deeper consideration. And then there will be, um, the committee did discuss um, three different times um, changing that policy. And um, the last alternative that they discussed was this goal and alternative policy language. Um, so this was not decided, they did not decide to include this in the draft, but um, this will be coming uh, next month for your consideration as well. And sorry, that's just do the slide. So just with that there, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, um, <clears throat> Ms. Shaw, this is Chair Antaviris. And I am wondering if this has been reviewed by the county attorney. I, I yes. somehow feel the answer to that is yes. Um, in the years that I have sat on this commission, I have never seen anything quite like this come before this commission. And that was why um, I'm wondering if review by legal counsel has been done in this case. Thank you for that question, Chair Ondaveros. And yes, the um, legal counsel helped write this um, alternative. The alternative language that we will um, share with you next month. So they have reviewed the issue. They We've had um, several discussions with them about the language um, that's in the draft and then um, some alternative policy language to consider. So okay, they've, thank been, you. they've yeah. been briefed on that. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Ms. Shaw. That, um, that that gives me some um, reassurance that this is being done correctly. Not that I doubted that it was being done incorrectly, but I would I kind of thought there might be some nuances that needed legal counsel. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Best, I see your hand raised. Yes, I just want to make sure we get this early because I'm sure it's a lot, and that this particular issue is is highlighted the way it has been just now. Thank you. We, th thank you. And that's um, actually a great segue because um, Jess McNeely just did suggest that we get the staff report to you early. So I will work on doing that and getting that to you. Prior even if to it's, receiving even the if packet. It's, yeah, even if it's just just this, yeah. Okay. Outside of the packet and certainly uh, highlight the issue that we just went over because it looks interesting. Thank you. I will do that. Thank you.
Any other questions? I'm, I'm not seeing any, Ms. Shaw. So, Mr. McNeely, would you uh, move to the next case? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Antaveros. Thank you, Melissa. The next case on your study session agenda is CUP 2249. It's a conditional use permit request for a campground on 10.8 acres in the G zone uh, off of 64 in Red Lake. And Zach is managing, uh, managing this case. Thanks for getting your screen up, Zach. Um, you're not in presentation mode right now. You were a second ago, Zach, but, but go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, let me just see if I can fix this real quick. Um, are you able to see the slides in presentation mode? Yep, it's in presentation mode now. Great, yeah. thank you. So, commissioners, uh, this was a case that was scheduled for tonight's hearing, and the recommendation from staff is to um, was to continue the case until next month and we can get into that, but this is the Fireside Campground. So we're in Red Lake area. Here's Highway 64. This is Grand Canyon Railroad uh, right of way. And this is the subject property. So it's bisected almost in half. I think there's six acres on the east side and maybe four acres or about that. Uh, on the west side of the subject property, general zone, surrounded by general zone. I think last month, um, Mr. Short handled a case for the uh, property just north of this for a campground use as well. Uh, so here's a zoom in on the subject property. There's some pretty decent topography heading downward toward the west. And this, part, this piece of the parcel uh, west of the Grand Canyon Railroad uh, right of way is it doesn't directly access through this parcel so basically all the development that's requested is requested on this eastern side uh, i have a site plan but uh, i've been going back and forth with the applicant and um, by the time that the staff report and analysis is written we'll have um, cleared up a couple of things on this site plan so the most recent iteration that i had had until today uh, showed 14 units, uh, that was 13 dome tents and one cabin that is inside the check, check-in building that they were showing. There was gonna be a livable space in there, which would count as a, a campsite unit and specifically a cabin. Uh, so the applicant is going to actually uh, show more dome tents on here so that the total is 17 campsite units. That's 16 dome tents and, and one cabin. Uh, this check-in building that's shown here uh, would be made out of storage containers. And one issue that needs to change on the site plan is that this, I'm sure it's not very easy to see, but there's kind of a rectangle here, which is an access easement to the parcel to the north. There needs to be a 30 foot setback for the building from that. And there are some topographical issues possibly, but um, setbacks are always measured from the edge of an e <clears throat> from the edge of an easement. Uh, the site plan also shows a pool, which I believe is also made out of storage containers. And in the staff report or attached to it, I'll make sure to include uh, the applicant had a, a good rendering of it. It looked actually pretty cool. Um, so that is something that's in shown as well. Uh, they have a storage building shown here, which is an A-frame building that was built. Uh, and they have community bathrooms and, and shower rooms that I'm assuming will also be containers too. I'll get the detail on that uh, shown on the site plan. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about this uh, site plan is that the most recent iteration that I've gotten from the applicant included eight electric vehicle charging stations. So many of them here, some of them here. Um, and so I just wanna clarify, uh, it will be clarified to, that that is just for charging electric vehicles and not to be for RV hookups. Um, so here are some elevations. They have an existing bathhouse 
on the property already. I'm not sure if they're looking, it didn't look like on the site plan, they were looking to keep that. Uh, I think they were going to go with more storage container look consistent with uh, this is the, these are the elevations for the check-in buildings here. So that will be clarified. As far as the proposed operation, um, they've revised their narrative to be six months per year, which is consistent with the allowance of the zoning ordinance or at least substantive policy statements that have been written for temporary structures. So the tents will be removed um, and every after a six month period uh, each year and the building division needs to inspect the install and takedown each year. The applicant has put in their narrative that they would have on-site managers 24 seven. Uh, and they also want to include aside from the pool, um, star, some stargazing, uh, some yoga for amenities. And I think that maybe on different cases, we may have gone back and forth. And if any of the other planners want to jump in at this time, um, there's some discussion about whether or not campgrounds should also be allowed to um, have food sales and food service um, and that sort of thing. I think staff's most recent look at this is if it's clearly incidental to the campground use and not just a commercial project open to everybody, but just um, if it is clearly for the internal guests for the campground um, and that it's only a, a small amount of space on uh, in either a floor plan or on a site plan that there would be some sales of prepackaged goods or something similar that campers would need to have. Um, I think staff's take is that that's uh, okay, but did any of the other planners want to jump in? Uh, thanks, Zach. Yeah, that's that's really what we discussed is is something that is accessory to an incidental, pretty consistent with other other uses that we have um, that we regularly deal with, um, and and we would see that as being consistent with the concept for these uh, uh, campgrounds being a low impact, low density um, campground. I mean, it's this is not commercial zoning, so they cannot have a retail operation. If it was something, you know, some some bottled water, hats and sunscreen for people who forgot them, uh, a couple of things like that, um, we would see that as actually being beneficial to the intent of the campgrounds. Um, uh, in that, uh, the the people staying at the campground, the guests would, could grab those things there and not have to make an extra trip into town someplace or someplace else. Um, so we, you know, as long as it was only incidental to and um, accessory to the campground, we were seeing that as um, as something that's just a part of a part of these campgrounds. Okay, so thanks for that, Jess. And if there are any comments on that, um, happy to take that input. Um, but yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Schwartz, I think that this would be timely now. I very okay. much appreciate the example of what of items that would be incidental to this use, what items would not be? Can you give me an example of items that would be considered prohibitive? Well, um, I think that the way that we would handle it is at the pre-application meeting, we would make it known that this is clearly incidental to guests only on the property, not for outside at, um, advertising it outside of the campground. And we would look on it, we would have them describe in their narrative what they, what exactly they would be selling and show on a site plan or floor plan where that would occur. So it would help us to determine that on a case by case basis. But I, I think it's like Jess was saying that it would be things like, you know, a, a bag of peanuts, a bottles of water, that sort of thing. Um, uh, maybe to be determined on a on a case by case basis, and I don't know if the other um, if Mr. McNeely wants to add to that or. Um, no, well, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, if if we got if we got a liquor license request for someone to be able to uh, sell um, yeah. sell liquor like a convenience store, we would say no, 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 no. You are not commercial zoning. Um, you're the G zone. 
this is conditional use for a low density, low impact campground. It can only be things that are incidental to um, the people, for the guests, for the convenience of the guests who are staying in the campground. Okay, okay, because I think having a retail, um, boy, I'll tell you, you gotta be, uh, you know, once, once the nose of the camel gets under the tent, it's not long before the body follows. And um, I do not believe that a retail store uh, would, I, I don't think retail would be appropriate in this zoning. Um, no. If it's limited and we can, and it can actually be classified as to, okay, here's, here's what is, but here's what can't be. Um, I wouldn't have a problem, but I, I don't want to, again, we got to be careful about the, the camel nose under the tent because Absolutely. this would be setting precedence. And I don't think it's a campground, not a retail facility. Absolutely. Right. And Chair Antaveros, I think that all of staff is thinks exactly the same. And that's why I think it's important for us to have the applicant put into their proposed narrative and site plan exactly what items, exactly where, so that um, the commission can make that decision whether or not it's um, the camel's nose is going too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and okay, so it's going to be limited to the guests that are there only. That's, right. I mean, that's, yes. that is in this, in this plan. Um, and so the plan on, on how that, how that's going to be monitored. So I've got some questions there. So I will be looking for the answers in the narrative. So Zach, if I could bring up one more thing on this, just uh, quickly, um, Madam Chair, the, what brought this up <laughs> again, because this is a moving target, this campground has been a moving target for us, but we had a pre-app a couple of weeks ago and it was uh, by REI, actually REI that does tour guides, you know, and then they, they wanted to get up, set up a campground for the people on the tours. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to feed them food as well, which makes sense. You take someone on a tour, you want to come back and you want to serve them food, not have them bring their own food. So, you know, that we brought that came up and we're like, well, that kind of makes sense that you could feed them just like if you're on a, like a wagon trail ride or something like that. You often, you know, feed people like that uh, or on a rafting trip down the Colorado Um so we're, you know, we started thinking about it again. And I think as long as the health, you know, that may be another thing that we're looking at is actually providing food. As long as the health department will, you know, as long as it gets approval through the health department, then they can do that. But for only people that are on the site. And we also were looking at kind of punishing people who uh, punishing everyone for bad actors. And we have a few bad actors in this arena. So uh, that's kind of what brought this up again. So there okay. are a lot of and moving. I, yeah. yeah, and I and I do understand that. If we look at the campground ordinance, um, I I just I want to be sure. I want to be sure that we don't start because if this campground can do it, then the next campground can do it and so on and so forth. And so basically you're gonna start having retail in a general zone mm -hmm. in very in probably rural areas. And I just wanna be sure that this doesn't open, open something that it not, ought not to be opening. I understand, I've been on tours where if you join us on this tour, you are going to be served a lunch, okay? Let us know if you need it to be vegetarian or not, okay? And so that was pretty much the choices. So we were, we were served that, but we were never given an opportunity to go in and peruse and buy and so on and so forth. You know, I, I think that we need to be real careful about allowing any retail into a non-commercial zone. That's, that's the point that I'm making. We need to be real careful about that. And I think, Madam Chair, it's a good point. Um, I think it's been good discussion. And I think 
Um, what I'll have for this case is to have the applicants be a, maybe a little, little bit more specific in their narrative and site plan about it. Um, if any of the commissioners after this hearing have thoughts about it, they can send me an email or send Jess and I an email and we can um, take a look at what staff should do with the analysis. And at the end of the day, you know, that will be up to the commission to approve. So um, through the analysis of this case, I'll try to be as detailed as possible and making sure that I, I think all of staff and the commission is concerned about opening up a general commercial type use in the the general zone that's not like it's the single family residential zone typically where it's not intended for so um we'll continue to have discussion on this and i'll try to in my analysis for this specific case make it as clear as possible these are the limitations and it is extremely limited and incidental to this use if the commission decides to approve that Okay, th um, thank you for that, Mr. Schwartz, because this is literally right next door to one that we approved. Um, if this use was approved here and that campground owner knew about it, I would not be surprised to see a modification come in on the other one as well. See, that's that's kind of what I'm talking about, that we got to be real careful here um, as, as we start allowing any kind of retail in a general zone outside of a commercial zone. And I'll, I'll leave it with that um, and go ahead and continue. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and agreed. Definitely um, staff will be talking amongst ourselves. And again, if the commission has any further comments, if you think of something tonight and want to send us an email, let's, let's discuss it further. Um, but to continue with this case, um, some of the standards and impacts that staff will be analyzing for this case, of course, we have a number of conditions that are uh, typically put on the campground conditions, like fencing the property with wildlife friendly fencing, uh, looking at offsite impacts and educational materials uh, for neighbors of the property, looking at no OHV use or rental, decibel limits at the property line, and all of those um, common sort of conditions that we put on these cases. So those, of course, will be part of this. Um, the reason that staff had recommended for tonight's hearing, if it were to happen, a continuance, um, looking at trying to get a will serve letter from High Country Fire Rescue. Um, I have recently talked with the Fire Chief Trotter uh, of that district, and he has let me know that there that the plan is in the works. So I think that we're getting to a place where we'll be able to get that will serve letter. Um, and that of course is one of the most important issues with any campground is, is getting that agreement in place. Um, so I think we'll probably be ready by the time it gets to the next hearing on that aspect. Staff will, of course, condition that there's an uh, ADOT traffic impact analysis or statement, whatever ADOT requires, and any required improvements from that the applicant will need to do prior to occupancy. Um, one thing I think is important, and I think the applicant has some of the colors of the buildings in the renderings, but uh, just want to dial in on that, exactly what colors we're looking for. So those are all the, the different things that I'm looking at. Um, happy to look at anything else if the commission has any other concerns. I do think that the applicant is with us this afternoon. So if you'd like to hear some additional input from them, uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to chime in as well. Uh, Commissioner Best, I see your hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, this is a gateway. Uh, you know, containers can be cool, but I don't. Uh, first of all, I don't know how well you can see them from the highway. And I just want to make sure that they are appropriate. Um, can you see them from the highway? So, uh, Commissioner Best, when I visited the property, to do my original noticing. There's a pretty steep uh, decline here from the highway. Um, and there are very large mature pinion juniper trees here, maybe like eight to 12 feet tall. So actually, I don't think even if they removed some of the trees here to do the development, it would be all that visible. 
Um, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder, of course, but the renderings, in my opinion, looked, uh, they were darker colored. I think they would sort of blend in here. The domes, I think, uh, will have the applicants send color renderings. And at least one other campground, the commission had required that they not be white, that they'd be more of an earth tone. In this area, it might be better to have them green or something. Um, so I don't, I think that the visual impact is mitigated by topography and vegetation, uh, but certainly staff will include in the analysis um, some of the renderings and conditions to uh, have the, all of the construction be consistent with um, a gateway rural type look. Great, thanks. Uh, another consideration is, uh... I think this um, campground sh shares highway access with the other campground. Are, are we trying to put together something that includes consideration of both of those? Because uh, it could get, you know, it could be, if you add these two together and we have 30 or 40 uh, units, it could be a pretty busy turn in. Right, um, Commissioner Best, so I know that Bob, with his case to the north, had had discussions with ADOT. I think this applicant has had discussions with ADOT. And ADOT is aware that both projects are occurring. ADOT had said that they wanted them to combine their traffic impact analysis. And to be frank, I'm not sure that the two campgrounds were able to meet in an agreement on doing that, or there were... There was some issue with that that the applicant could maybe elaborate on with you. But since that, I think Bob has spoken with ADOT and they will accept um, separate traffic impact analyses and look at the impacts. Um, ADOT is aware of both of these projects occurring. And I, I think that they will be aware of looking at the cumulative effect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so if the commission has any other questions or anything to add, again, the applicant is with us and probably can clear up any questions you have as well on their end. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, this is Chair Tavares. I would like to ask um, the applicant because you have, the applicant has no doubt heard the conversation that has taken place, the questions that have been asked. If they could briefly offer on um, uh, some clarification on that, I think it would be helpful. This is uh, Zach Stoltenberg with Clockwork where the uh, architects representing the client for this project. Um, uh, the first clarification I'd addressed was on the units and the unit count. Um, you know, when we met with this committee previously, uh, you gave us some good feedback on the number of units that we had. Um, I believe we're at right around eight acres or just shy of eight acres on the front half of the property. And so we, we have made a revision to reduce the overall unit count uh, to keep sort of more in spirit with the, the two per acre uh, overall requirement. Um, so the 17 that are proposed, it, it, and it is 17 total units, um, is uh, the the dome sites as well as one uh, full-time manager's residence or caretaker's residence on the property. Um, so I can I can clear that piece of it up. Um, also in the revision and in some of the the feedback from the client and some of the market analysis that's been done for the area, the electric charging uh, came up as a big need. Um, and it, it is kind of a trend in resort design in general, but in this area specifically, there seems to be um, a, a higher need than what is currently serviceable um, or available. And so we have uh, added that to the, the parking plan. Uh, I think the applicant had some concern over that because those vehicles are generally parked for long periods of time while they charge. And so the concern was over how would that have a net impact on the additional parking that we would need for guests? 
Um, unfortunately, with a lot of the charging networks, because they're all tied into a network. Um, so if you put those chargers in as a part of one of the programs, it, they have to be open to the public. So there would be uh, an opportunity where people stopping to charge their EVs uh, may not be resort guests. And so we did increase the standard number of parking spaces to account for long-term EV charging and, and make sure that that doesn't have a, a negative effect on the, the net spaces available to our guests. For the guests, we'll have one space per unit. Um, on the uh, question of the retail, um, you, you guys are absolutely correct that uh, we envision this as a very limited scope, things that would be um, supplemental to resort guests, sunscreen, sodas, bottles of water, a hat, things like that. Um, there's, there's no desire and no intention for you know, a, a convenience store or something. There's, there is a gas station that's just down the road, um, both to the north and to the south. And so we felt like we don't have to do all of that stuff on site, um, but you know, having a few staples and some incidentals there uh, that would be convenient for the guests to access, that's, that's what the intention was with the retail component. Um, Zach, this is Chair Ontiveros. Something that you brought up um, in your narrative right now that I wasn't aware of is you talked about the eight EV charging stations. Um, is this something, are you going to be charging the customers that come in to use these charging stations? I think we're actually looking at um, really just contracting with one of the, the larger providers. I know there's been discussions with uh, Tesla and with Rivian. Um, Rivian especially mm -hmm. likes to locate near national parks. And uh, I love national. And so um, I. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, can I please ask. Um, hello, can I please ask Manu Chopra to mute? Manu, thank you. Um, I'm sorry for that, Zach. Um, you left off with, you were giving, excuse me, Manu Chopra, please mute and stay muted. Thank you. Um, if you could please pick up where you left off on the charging stations, I would appreciate it. Yeah, so like I said, we've, we've just kind of uh, begun the investigation stages of that, but more than likely we would be looking at, at one of these major national networks. Um, there is also like Electrify America and some more um, cooperative type uh, functions with that. I believe in some cases, um, the people that utilize those chargers pay to be a member of that network. And then that network, you know, goes and, and finds the locations to do that. So we as a resort will not be charging guests for that. But if we go through one of those services, then they would pay a fee to that service. Um, the, the reason we're looking at the services is they will come in and do the installation and provide the equipment and all of that at no cost. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to ask if any of the other commissioners have any questions of the applicant at this time, and then I'm going to address staff. So, yeah, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Commissioner Best. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd ask the same question that I asked before about coordinating with ADOT uh, to make sure, sure that the uh, gateway into the several campgrounds, at least two, uh, makes sense. Yeah, so I can um, share some, some insight on that as well. Um, so our conversations initially with ADOT, um, when we reached out to them, because there, there is this you know, access easement that is, is filed, um, and we were able to actually track that back um, and, and get the, the records and the copies of that. Um, what was built um, is slightly different than what was originally filed back in the, the 80s or something. So that was updated 
uh, more recently here. And the direction that we got from ADOT was, you know, we're looking at both of these. We don't want to get two separate applications. Reach out to the other property owner and see if you guys can do this together. And so we did that. Uh, we, we reached out to the, the property owner to our north that has the, the easement that crosses our property. Um, they were um, very rude and, and unwilling to even talk about any of it. Um, we reached out to a local civil engineer that does those traffic studies. They refused to perform that for us because they were working for the other applicant and he had threatened to sue them if they took on our project. Um, and so we've now gone to a, an outside firm. Um, I believe they're based out of Tucson um, in order to get the, the traffic impact statement done. Um, the initial early analysis that we've had is that we're looking at probably in the neighborhood of seven cars per hour at the most in the, the um, peak kind of check-in period in the, in the afternoon. And we'd probably be looking around five cars an hour in the check-out period in the morning. And so both of those um, numbers, even coupled with, if because we know the number of units on the property to the north. So we've provided um, our traffic engineer with that unit count to consider in our report. Um, and they've said, you know, even adding the, I think it's seven units or, or something that's to the north, um, that does not increase our count. The, the way they do the counts, it's like a, a classification. And the A classification is the lowest impact piece. Um, and in order to bump us up to a B, where we would need to possibly look at um, changing that intersection or that drive or you know traffic uh, signals or signage or something like that, um, we would need to be a significantly higher number of units on the property. Um, and so they said, you know, if we calculate just the proposed resort that is on our property, it would be classified as an A. If we, if we uh, evaluate both of those two properties together, it would still be classified as an A. So it, it would not have an, a net overall impact, at least from the, the preliminary numbers that we've gotten back. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe that's... Uh... Now, I will say that, um, again, our conversation with ADOT, they said, you know, we will reject any traffic study from either property that does not include a complete analysis of both sites. So we are doing that for our property on our own because the adjoining property owner has been unwilling to um, coordinate or, or cooperate. So I'm, I'm not sure how, I'm guessing that was a condition of their approval from this body. So I'm not sure how they're, they're going to meet that. Okay, well, that sounds like we need an internal discussion among commissioners and staff. Thank you very much. Well, for, from, uh, from the staff standpoint, uh, we um, permitting, all permitting processes uh, to, to pass muster through our engineering permitting process is going to require a, a uh, traffic impact, in this case, traffic impact statement, if you know the difference between a traffic impact statement and traffic impact analysis is going to suffice because these are very low numbers. Um, but yeah, no one is going to uh, complete the permitting process. Uh, a permitting process is going to require um, traffic impact um, statement and, and uh, all required improvements that would come along with this. I completely understand what, what Zach from Clockwork is saying that um, these numbers are, are so low that it is not anticipated that um, the additional improvements at this intersection would be necessary. But uh, to, um, to leave any, any questions that you might have, Commissioner Best, um, traffic impact is always required through the permitting process for any project like this. Um, okay, this is Chair Antaveras and thank you, Zach, and thank you, Mr. McNeely, for that, for the clarification and explanation on the traffic. Um, I also was, um, Commissioner Best asked the question that I was going to ask, so I very much appreciate that. One thing that 
I did not realize until this evening is, is that this proposal is planning on putting in eight EV charging stations for vehicles that are not associated with the campground. Uh, this question is uh, directed to staff. How does that fit in with the campground ordinance? That in, yeah, that was, thanks for bringing that up. And this is the first that we are that we kind of become aware of that Zach, Zach kind of raised you know when we had some internal uh, discussion on this. Zach raised the question of like, wow, there's uh, you know uh, a lot of extra charging, and I can't imagine why um, why a campground this small, 16 total campsites, um, would need a would need that many EV stations. So. As a campground, this is G zone, which is single family residential rule uh, zoning. The, uh, the conditional use permit is only for low density, low impact campgrounds. The use of this site can't be for anyone other than those who are, um, are uh, accessing the site for, for, the, for, the camp, for the campground use. So um, Zach from Clockwork, you, you guys are gonna have to um, process that and look at your options um, yeah. because from a land use perspective this zone does not allow that land use for a charging station uh, that is that is it's not a possibility under our zone okay areas. well I, I appreciate the the clarification like i said this is this is a more recent iteration um and so i i and i will add some clarity that the eight is the total again we're trying to kind of plan for the future electric vehicles are are not going away um our initial plan is to install two on the property and install the the conduits and the infrastructure for future when the demand um, meets that need okay. so you know I, I think that's the initial is we, we just don't want to have to come back and modify a conditional use permit or go through county process if we put the two up and they're full all the time and there's a big demand for for additional uh, sites, we'd like to just be able to go ahead and install those. Um, and certainly if we need to restrict that to guests only, uh, that may change some of what we're looking at as far as uh, availability and partnerships out there, um, mm -hmm. but we would be willing to do that and, and restrict the, the access to those to resort guests only. Absolutely, yeah. Under this zoning, it would have to be restricted to only resort guests only. And our long range planner, Melissa mentioned, you, you may want to check with uh, APS um, to see what um, uh, partnerships they have available for charging stations for situations like this. So, yeah, Madam it's, Chair, it's good info, and we'll definitely check into it. If uh, I could yes, just, Mr. Schwartz, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I could just piggyback onto that as the planner handling the case, I'd just like to get if we can, and not to belabor the point, but maybe some thoughts on that from the commission. I think Mr. McNeely summed it up pretty well that, you know, the fueling station use is a commercial use that doesn't, it cannot be permitted in this zone. So I would, I would wonder how the commission feels about number of EV charging stations that, um, that staff might considering reducing if, that's something that the commission would want to see. Um, and I think definitely staff would condition it that it would be just for internal guests, but that might be something that's difficult to enforce. Um, thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, this is Chair Antaveras. And if, there, if, if an EV is going to be charged, there is going to be a payment somehow, some way from the chargee to the charger. And now we are heading down that road of retail. And I am getting very uncomfortable because the nose under the tent, you get a camel's nose under the tent and the body will follow. And I am very uncomfortable about this use. It is a campground. Mm -hmm. It is a campground. It is not retail. It is not a charging station for vehicles. If we allow it at this one, we are going to have to allow it at every other campground. They can come in and get modifications. And I do not believe that that was ever the intent. When we worked on this campground ordinance, I don't believe that that was ever the intent. How this would ever be enforced is beyond me. 
I, I, I think that we're opening a can of worms that we're, that we ought not to be opening. Those are my thoughts, but I am interested in what the other commissioners think. Uh, Commissioner Best, your hand is raised. Yeah, the wheels are turning here in my brain. Uh, I, I think that uh, everything I know tells me that um, electric vehicles are coming, that it would be kind of impractical. In other words, we're, we're gonna sell bottled water, personal hygiene items, um, you know, maybe prepackaged snacks because that's what people need to be comfortable as they travel. Um, charging stations, for internal use only, I think are going to sort of become that as well. Um, I would be comfortable with maybe two uh, and conduit for expansion and a rule that um, they only be used for internal use. And uh, there is a camel's nose issue here, but I, th I think the future, as I think to the future, as I think of myself traveling around to arrive somewhere late in the evening, uh, I would think a motel, a hotel, a campground would almost have to have a charging station. Um, I think it's going to be standard in the industry. And I think, um, we can. I, I look at it from that from I, I look at it from a future point of view, and I'm comfortable just just with a couple of them, with possibly some capacity for expansion, and a tightly written condition. And uh, personally, I like you know, <laughs> I am I am not uh, comfortable really with. Uh, forever CUPs. I want to see people back here again after a while and see how they're doing and if they're following the rules. Because with forever CUPs, I don't think anybody ever checks up. So that is a rambling statement because I'm kind of making it up as I go along here, but uh, that's where I am. A couple of them with possibility for expansion, only overnight guests using that. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Best. Commissioner Ruggles. Yeah, I think uh, my point of view would be very much uh, the same as that of Commissioner Bess in that uh, having two charging stations initially with the ability to uh, put in the infrastructure, namely the conduit uh, and the uh, pads for any future expansion, whatever is necessary, uh, could be allowed. I have no problem with saying come back for a modification of the use permit or with a short term initial approval of the CUP, come back in three years, say, and uh, ask for additional charging stations based on what has happened in the last three years. Uh, I also think that part of my guidance is just like that, that of uh, our chair, in that uh, we have to be very careful about letting the camel's nose under the tent. That's always uh, in the, the forefront of my thinking about these kinds of things also. So that sums it up for me. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. Do any other commissioners have any questions or comments? Uh, for Mr. Schwartz as he goes, he's asked for those. I'm not seeing any Mr. Schwartz. Um, so if you would like to, Mr. McNeely, if you would like to move to um, the next case. Please. Absolutely, thank you, Chair Antiveros. The next case Zach has as well. So he can, he can share his screen. It's CUP 2275, also a CUP for a campground on 10.25 acres, um, pretty remote site. This is um, pretty near uh, Grand Canyon National Park. So Zach, go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good evening.
evening. This is Grand Canyon glamping conditional use permit request. And I think possibly this has gone to study session before. I'm not sure. Um, maybe Mr. Short was handling it. Um, but so here we are. Here's a vicinity map. Here's Highway 64 going through Tucson. Uh, the incorporated town of Tucson is shown uh, in this dotted line here. And my understanding is that there are some forest service roads that lead out to the subject property here, this triangle shaped uh, piece in the general zone. It's uh, I think just over 10 acres in size, um, very close to Grand Canyon National Park. And here is Grand Canyon uh, Railway right of way adjacent to the property as well. Um, here is a, an aerial of the subject property. So I believe that there is access from the Forest Service Road up to the property here through this other property. I think the owner of this property also owns this property as well. <clears throat> and I haven't been to the site. It looks like there's some topography and definitely um, some vegetation there. So what the applicant is requesting here is eight, 10, tent units, and there's one existing dwelling, which I believe is the home of the property owner on the subject property. So here's the access again coming through uh, the other property from Forest Service um, to the property, and th these are the different tents. This is the existing dwelling, and they would have some bathroom buildings here. I believe what the applicant or the applicant's representative is showing here are maybe some additional vegetation that would be added. And certainly it looks like on this aerial that the applicant's representative provided that there is a decent amount of vegetation there. It also looks quite steep. Uh, the applicant has just some very general sort of concept plans for the tents. Uh, this is the photo that was shown in the applicant's narrative. Uh, these would be up for six months a year, consistent with what we allow for campgrounds. Here is one uh, ADA accessible restroom. It's uh, portable. Uh, and here is um, the typical type of restroom shown here. There's a shower in it as well uh, for the property. Uh, on their plans, they also show some lighting. So we have these sort of solar lights that you just kind of place, I would imagine. It's not shown on the site plan, uh, but I would imagine these would be along tr internal trails, that sort of thing. It looks fully shielded. I haven't seen this type before, a solar one uh, that has exactly the fully shielding that you see here, but it's good. Uh, and then they show some string lights uh, and they've done some lumen calculations here and staff hasn't yet been able to analyze that but certainly there would be a condition about dark skies lighting it, holding it to residential standards um, and a lighting permit would be required. The applicant's also showing some signage that they would like to have for the property and they don't um, specify what sizes they're looking for here, but the zoning ordinance has a size limitation and um, that's what would be conditioned on this use permit. Uh, so I think I've gone through most of what's on this slide, except for that they also plan to have fire pits, which I don't see on the site plan, and maybe some cornhole. As far as standards, conditions, and impacts that staff would be looking to analyze, the biggest thing that I wanted some input on from the commission, um, and actually I think in the past staff has held this um, use permit from going forward to study session because we found it as an incomplete application because the zoning ordinance requires that there is a valid service agreement with a fire district or department um, and a firewise an emergency plan for the property. So I think the applicant has for months now been discussing with the Tucson fire department uh, whether or not they could get service. And at the end of the day, I'll also um, ask if Mr. Short, the principal planner, might be able to jump in. He had dealt with this case before I had. Um, 
But my understanding is that the Tucson Fire District doesn't want to give a service agreement, but they have provided some documentation that they will <clears throat> respond when available and will make reasonable efforts to make a response. Uh, the applicant also submitted some documentation from the Kaibab National Forest, um, their, whoever does their um, fire fighting, that they could respond if requested by local and state fire authorities, but I'm not sure exactly what that means or if they generally would be able to respond to maybe structure fires on the property itself. So, um, you know, obviously this is one of the bigger concerns with the campground is that there's um, a fire district that's able to assist on the property that they have a sh short response time. Um, I think the Tucson Fire District is willing to create a firewise plan with the applicants as far as staff typically conditions or receives as part of the application. The design of fire pits, possible thinning, if the fire district needs to have some sort of infrastructure on site to help um, aid in fire suppression. Uh, so I think the Tucson Fire District is willing to do that, but uh, <clears throat> there's language in the fire district's letter, the re most recent letter that I've been looking at, that leaves it, in my opinion, a little bit up in the air. And I'd like, um, if it's okay with the commission for Principal Planner Bob Short to, I think he might have more comment on this. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, for for many months we had uh, we had called this application incomplete because they hadn't provided a uh, they weren't able to provide a valid service agreement. And uh, the Tucson Fire Department they pretty much are contained within Tucson. I think their clientele in Tucson have not allowed them to provide fire agreements outside. But uh, to be honest with you, they've been a little bit, they've kind of been a little bit upset by that because uh, this does look like a well-designed campground in a good location. And, you know, they've hired an engineering firm. They've done everything right, except for the fact that they don't have a, they, they couldn't get a valid service agreement. Uh, the director is basically, you know, I've discussed this with him many times and he's indicated their, their, um, application is not complete until they can provide that. And then recently, Jay, the director, did talk to, I believe, the chairman of the board of the fire district and had a long conversation. And they said that they would respond to a fire at this site and they would put it out, but they could not provide, provide a service contract, which means when they went out and responded to a fire at that site, they would the applicant would uh, would get a bill for that, a very large bill, as you probably know. Uh, so we were looking at possibly putting that as a uh, condition of approval for the campground. And uh, and th th this is also located uh, close to, you know, like a national forest fire station. It's my understanding. I'm not sure exactly where it is. It might be right in Tucson. Uh, and it's also located about three miles from Grand Canyon National Park. In fact, there's a road you can get right into the park from there. Uh, uh, with I, I don't even think you have to pay to go through there, but you, there is a road right into the park. It's like three miles away. It's like five miles from Grand Canyon Village. And, uh, you know, Grand Canyon National Park would also respond to fires in this area. It's not clear. Uh, my understanding is they wouldn't, they wouldn't respond to fires on private property with structures. They would make sure that the fire didn't get off the property uh, and, you know, obviously threaten the forest or the national park. So that's what it's come down to. I did, I wasn't aware of this language that Zach's pointing out here where it says, um, Let's see, it, uh, Tucson Fire District notes they will respond when available and will make reasonable efforts. I think that has something to do with the, you know, the fact that sometimes fire departments are bit, are, have already responded to another fire. And if that happens, then obviously they don't have the equipment to go to this fire. 
So I believe what that's saying is the priority is within the village of Tucson. And uh, so, you know, if there was a fire in Tucson, they had to respond to that first before they go to a fire here. But of course, most of the time, you know, fire districts aren't responding to a, a fire. I mean, it could it can happen, of course. But anyway, that's the best that I have to explain that. I did note that the applicant is here and she can comment as well. Um, Mr. Short, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Chair Ontiveros. What, can you please read the language in the ordinance concerning this? I would have to pull that up, but basically. Hey, Bob, I, I can do it. Okay. Um, I've got it. I've got it pulled up. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. The, um, all right. It is. Madam Chair, is my screen sharing right now with the zoning ordinance up? Uh, oh yes, yeah. it, it is. Okay, there you got it. all right. Thanks. So, so here it is, and thanks, Bob, for there we go. adding to that. So it says, campground shall maintain a valid service agreement with a recognized fire safety and emergency services organization. I do want to note that they did get from Guardian Medical Transport a letter, a will serve letter. It also says, um, a firewise plan and emergency response plan to be approved by the local fire responder and or community development director is required. Such a plan may require, um, and it, it goes on to describe things that would be in the response plan. But I think the key is campgrounds shall maintain a valid service agreement with the recognized fire safety and emergency services organization. And, um, you know, this is the reason why staff was going to recommend tonight continuance of the case that you just heard on the study session also. Um, okay, what I'm wondering is, is this is obviously something that is in the order. Is that something that is waivable? We can give a variance on? Nope. Is it even something that we, that the commission has any wiggle room on? It, no, it is not. It, it, it is. It's a requirement of the ordinance. The, a, a campground cannot be in. Uh, um, yeah, a campground cannot operate um, without the valid service agreement. Okay, and just to recap, this applicant does not have a valid service agreement. Correct, Madam Chair. I think that. I do have letters and I can send these to the commission because I only just gave excerpts about portions that staff was concerned about. Um, I mean, I there's not a definition for valid service agreement. And in my opinion, I, I don't see that there is one. Um, but so I think that that was the question that the community development director wanted to see the interpretation of the commission. Oh, okay, um, my next question is, has, boy, I'll tell you what, we've, I feel like, I feel like our campground ordinance is, is really being tested right now. The case that we had before and with this one, okay. Um, a valid service agreement, if we don't, th th that is not defined in the definitions in our ordinance? It is not. So the terms that you see in green, those are all defined. Valid okay. service agreement is not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so has, the, has our legal counsel um, reviewed this and offered an opinion concerning this? This seems more like a legal issue because when I think of a valid service agreement, the valid service agreements that I have are pretty simple. If the, you know, I, I, I agree it's written in writing by the parties. It's, a, it's an agreement mm -hmm. that you will perform this for me if need be. And from what I'm understanding here, it is, well, if we can, but we're not going to give you a, a, like a contract or an agreement. And um, the case before this and this case are, are really causing me pause. Because um, once, we, once we open the door, 
it's open for everything going forward. Um, Commissioner Best, I see your hand raised. You need one of those. That's pretty cool. Take it. Um, could Final I please points. ask Faber? Uh, okay, you have muted. Thank you. Commissioner Best, please go ahead. Yeah, a couple of points. Um, be because the term is not well defined, it might be possible to put together a service agreement, which uh, number one says we will respond and charge you a lot of money, mm -hmm. but we will respond. Uh, but we also have the, the fire wires and fire safety issue. And that might have to be uh, from a consultant if, if a fire department won't do it. But I, I'm looking at the aerial plan in uh, imagery on my other computer here, and it's pretty heavily forested. Um, it's out in the middle of nowhere, down a very long dirt road which uh, may or may not be county maintained. Is that road county maintained? Commissioner Best, it's not. Um, it's a forest service road. And at this point, I haven't been able to research um, whether or not the forest service maintains it. And the okay. applicant is here and I, I do see that they have their hand raised as well. Okay, so that's an issue too, because I, I think another condition in the campground ordinances that it be on a county maintained road. Uh, there's also the issue that, um, uh, speaking personally, tripped me up with windmill farms, that this is a private parcel completely surrounded uh, by public lands. And we have a, an element of the comprehensive plans that says do not develop those very intensely. Um, the fire issue to me is huge. Now, this is on the edge of Grand Canyon National Park. Seems to be pretty heavily forested and having a bunch of folks out there from uh, parts of the world that are not uh, used to dealing with fire safety uh, gives me pause. So those are a couple of things I'm thinking about. Thanks. Um, thank you, Commissioner Best. I would like um, well, first, let me ask if any of the other commissioners, um, Commissioner Ruggles, I see you yeah. unmuted. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, I think uh, several of the things that I had in mind to bring up, uh, Commissioner Best has already raised those. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that no one has mentioned is uh, that uh, we have had a couple of cases in the past where uh, the applicant had to apply to the Forest Service for a special permit to utilize that road. And in those cases, uh, we did not give them the CUP until they had that uh, agreement or uh, that special permit in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those cases was one involving Enosha Ryan and uh, Oak Creek Canyon. And the other one was, uh, I think it was a group home that was off of Edson Road, which is uh, out Loop Road, just a little ways. So um, if that was the case, um, that kind of sets a precedent for us as commissioners, I believe. And that has to be considered uh, because uh, saying, yes, it's in process. I know that did not work for Ms. Ryan. Um, we did not complete that case until she actually had the uh, special use perm or the permit in hand from the Forest Service. Um, so uh, this is something to consider as we go forward. Um, I, I would, I'm gonna piggyback on Commissioner Ruggles' comments. I believe it was at last month's meeting, we gave a perpetual continuance to the auto camp in Williams because they don't have their access cleared up as well. And I believe the Forest Service is involved in that. This may not be an exact apples to apples, but that camp does not have um, legal access to the property. And I'm, if, it's my, if I'm understanding this correctly, this applicant does not have legal access yet either. Is that right, Mr. Schwartz? Madam Chair, I think that there possibly would be legal access for 
the existing dwelling on the property, but when the use changes, I'm not sure how the Forest Service looks at that. Um, I think that we've oftentimes required uh, as a condition that the applicants get the special use agreement is what it's called from the Forest Service for whatever particular use that they have prior to initiating the use. And I don't think that we've had a whole lot of problem with that. And I definitely can understand uh, Commissioner Ruggles' point of view and giving that example. I do remember that was actually one of my cases. Uh, yes. Um, but I don't, and maybe the applicant can actually clarify this. I don't recall seeing that there was a special use permit for access in part of the submittals for this case so far. I just one additional clarification for uh, our uh, chair. The uh, case from last month, uh, that uh, special permit dated back to 1947. Uh, I read that uh, permit and uh, it was given to the county for very specific use. Uh, and uh, those are some of the details. Uh, I hope that clarifies it just a little bit. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. And I, I know that that was quite a convoluted case that it may take them time to work through. But yes, I did remember that. And thank you, um, though, for pointing that out. Um, Commissioner Best, your hand is still raised. Do you have any other questions before I open it to the applicant for clarification? I do, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm looking at uh, this piece of property on the county parcel viewer in imagery mode, and I'm seeing buildings on what appears to be National Forest land between the parcel and the Forest Service road. So that is an issue I, I'd ask staff to take a look at. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Best. Commissioner Clifford? Can this applicant join the fire district to get, at, get um, fire support? My understanding, Commissioner Clifford, is that the Tucson Fire District will not annex the property. Okay. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Clifford. Okay, I would like to ask the applicant at this time to address the questions, concerns that have been raised um, in the conversation. And then I also see Muggy on engineering Unmuting. Um, is Muggy on Engineering, uh, let's see, a representative of this? Madam case? Chair, I don't think they are. Um, certainly, I think we have on here Christine Laguna yes, is no. uh, the applicant's representative. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and hear from the applicant um, first. Uh, Commissioner Best, let me just reach out to you one more time. Your hand is still raised. Do you have any, um, okay, now it's not, okay. Um, I would like to, to now allow the applicant um, time to clarify and answer the questions. Hi there, this is Fabian Swan, formerly GESA, um, and I'm the applicant. Um, a couple things first, Commissioner Best, I think you not noted the, that there's buildings that are on the Forest Service land. Yes, that, that's what I that's what I see on the maps, but the maps can be wrong. So yeah, yeah. I'm so just our reporting problem, what I see. Yeah. Yeah, it gave us a little fright when we first saw that as well. Um, but our property actually butts right up to or the two properties butt right up to the uh, railway property line. So it's just shifted down um, that little bit. Um, and then in regards to fire coverage. That's been our main concern all through this process. So we've been working with 2CN Fire, and I know 2CN Fire has been working with um, Jay Crystalman as well as Patrice Horseman, who's our representative. Um, and they came up with this proof of service agreement. So even though it's not, it doesn't say service contract, we're not paying up front but it has all of the same language that a service contract says. Um, I know you guys uh, stated some concern about 
you know, they'll show up if they can. Um, all service agreements say that. That's just to protect the fire departments um, from any liability. Um, and then also that we won't be paying up front, but we would be paying, you know, on a time and materials basis if 2CN Fire did reply or respond to a fire at our property. Um, and I know um, other fire departments do that same thing. There's no way that a fire department could just have a one-time annual fee and then respond to a fire that costs, you know, $20,000 and they're not going to pass that on um, to that property owner. I know that High Country does um, have a pricing structure specifically for their subscription customers. Um, let's see. And I know there's not um, a fire pit on that plan. I apologize for that, but we are just going to have one fire pit um, that my husband Bass and I will man monitor as the owner operators. Um, and I think the other thing, oh, Zach, on that first um, site plan that you showed, there were all those little circles that kind of went along the paths in the road. Um, that's just what our engineer put in as our max lighting. So that's where we could have those solar lights that you showed. We're not going to be adding any other vegetation um, to this property. Um, okay. And oh, oh and I'm I, sorry. Please go ahead. Sorry. I know you also asked if your attorney had reviewed this document. And they have, um, and I believe you share the same attorney with 2CN Fire. So their attorney has also reviewed our proof of service agreement. Oh, and the other thing, the road permit, we are working with the Forest Service to get that road access permit for commercial use on our property. Um, we've been working on it since about February, and everybody that manages that program has left the Forest Service. Um, so they're kind of, well, they're running a lot behind. Um, my contact there has reassured me that I should have the final copy by the end of this week. Um, hopefully, that is the case. Um, to prove that we do have access on that road. Um, and I think that, let me know if there's anything I didn't make notes cover. Okay, um, actually, I think you did. Um, I think you did a really good job of responding to all the, the questions slash concerns that were brought up. And uh, Mr. Schwartz, I will say that what you have typed in and highlighted in yellow reach out to attorney team. Um, I was going to ask if you would please confirm with our legal counsel that they are okay with the, with the, uh, the agreement as, as it stands now. Um, Mr. Best, your hand is raised. Do you have a question for the applicant? Uh, yes, is this uh, Ponderosa or PJ? We are all of the above, ponderosa pine, pinyon pine, juniper. Okay, yeah. Um, my, uh, I'm very co concerned that there really be a system of fire safety, um, not just an agreement to respond. So okay. it, it could be that if, if you can't uh, get that through a fire department, you may have to get an outside consultant, but we definitely want, you know, a, a systematic, programmatic look at how to keep the campground safe and how to keep the adjacent forest safe. Uh, that, that's probably the biggest concern that I would have in this case. Yeah, absolutely. And that's our biggest concern as well. Um, I grew up on this property. I've been out here my whole life. Um, and fires have always been a concern, right? Not necessarily an internal, internally caused fire, but one from the national forest that surrounds us. Um, we'll have specific water tanks designated just for um, 
fire suppression. suppression. Um, we plan to have, you know, a water tank on a trailer that has a pump and hoses. Mm -hmm. And that's also why we're only having one campfire um, so that it is easily monitored. We're not running around, you know, to eight different tent sites, making sure that at the end of the night, they're all put out. Okay, thanks. Um, so if, if you are not working with a fire chief who's going to certify that uh, he is managing the plan, then uh, I think it would be reasonable to see some other uh, sufficiently qualified group or individual who comes up with a plan. And we might have to get into the weeds a little more, uh, no pun intended, um, because we don't have a fire chief behind us. We, we may actually have to see the entire plan. Um, I, well, and also, uh, I, I, this is a general question to staff and the applicant. Um, do we ever get in a situation where we can do thinning on forest service lands around some of these parcels? Because um, this is kind of a longish, narrowish parcel. If we had <clears throat> a fire sweeping across this landscape, the folks on this land would not be safe. Uh, do we have double um, egress is another question. Very important question, because you could have your Forest Service road in a fire coming your way. And what's plan B for getting off the property? So a couple of fire is just uh, a huge concern. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. So we have, yeah, as... Um... Bob Short was saying there is Rowell Road, which does go into the National Park. It's actually an emergency exit plan for the park for if there was a fire um, that blocked Highway 64. So it's pretty well maintained. And then you can go up, yep, 328 and 328A, which is just across the railway from our property. That goes into Tucson, or you can continue 328 and go all the way out to the Havasupai Reservation. Um, so there's quite a few, and you could always run the railroad tracks if things got really sketchy. <laughs> okay, thank you. But uh, but again, uh, and, we'd like to see a written plan from yeah e either yeah, a fire either a fire marshal who says I take responsibility for the plan, or a written plan. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And we are working with Two CN Fire, who has given us that proof of service. Um, we've had the fire chief out to do kind of a preliminary defensible space inspection and just let us know what we should be looking at working on. My husband and I have spent this entire summer uh, raking pine needles and uplifting trees so that there, you know, if there was a ground fire, it wouldn't get lifted into the ponderosas. Um, like I said, fire is also our number one um, concern. And we have been working with Chief Brush. Um, for most of, well, maybe a year now, and he's been very helpful in this process. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you so much for that explanation. And after hearing um, your clarification, it is, it is very obvious that you are taking fire safety and concern very seriously. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, we just have to, to make sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So yep. thank you very much for that. Um, and I also see Christina Laguna that with her hand raised. So Ms. Laguna, if you would like to address, go ahead and address, please, please do so. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commission members. I just wanted to reiterate um, and address some of the comments and reiterate a few things that Fabian mentioned. Um, with regards to the discrepancies between the county GIS and the boundary, we have paid a surveyor to do a boundary survey and the site plan that we provided is based upon that boundary and topographic survey. So those show the actual locations of the boundary lines uh, in relation to um, Grand Canyon Railroad, uh, right away, as well as um, the National Forest, so that you can see that all of the buildings that are on these two parcels are indeed within the, their own 
property lines. Um, as far as uh, Fabian's efforts with the Forest Service for access, she does have a draft non-federal commercial road use permit. So, uh, and uh, we did include that with a submittal, but we can provide it again. And the draft document that they have put together um, discusses uh, the fact that she is a commercial entity and grants her um, use of the road for five years. And um, she's, she spent a lot of time working on that. And there is a fee that she will have to pay to the Forest Service for this, uh, for this access. Um, the Forest Service roads, I've driven out there myself. The, the site is beautiful. It's one of the best glamping sites we've, I've, I've seen. Um, and it would be a shame if we couldn't uh, let this family use this site for glamping. They've been there for 40 years. As Fabian said, she grew up on this parcel and she's um, familiar with the area. And there are trees, it's well treated. The road is very well maintained by the Forest Service. Um, I drove it with my little SUV, it didn't have any problems. And um, as far as the 42,000 GVW, we plan on certifying that uh, with bringing out um, uh, the required vehicle. Usually we use water trucks that are filled with water because those are typically the heaviest large uh, vehicles that go onto these roads. Just to confirm that it's adequate, but uh, in a visual check, it's all, it's, it's very well maintained by the Forest Service. And the, the septic, we have had test holes dug and it does qualify for a standard system. We've done a preliminary design on the site plan and that's included in the submittal um, on sheet one, I believe, if you wanna take a look at that. And uh, yeah, I, I think it'll be a beautiful site. Um, and I, I think that uh, the fact that the owners have been in the area for 40 years um, shows that this is a, is a very reputable group of people and I think they're going to do a great job of representing the Grand Canyon in this area. Um, thank, thank you for that, Ms. Laguna. Um, Fabian, I, this is Chair Ontiveros, and I apologize if this information was given out, but you, there will be some form of management on the property 24 seven. Yes, that's correct. Either me or my husband, or maybe my parents will be here at all times. Okay, okay, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to reach uh, Commissioner Best. Your hand is raised. Yeah, just, uh, I assume staff has shared with you the conditions that we usually apply to campgrounds. Is that true, staff or applicant? We have about 16 now conditions that we, that are, have become pretty standard, including 24 hour, uh, Yep. Manning of the property, but uh, you might might want to look over that list and make sure you're comfortable with it. Uh, I, I think uh, since you're locals, you'll understand it and appreciate it, but uh, <laughs> you wouldn't want to be surprised on the other end either. So, yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I am looking to see if there's anybody else unmuted or hands raised, and I'm not seeing any. So, um, thank you to Fabian and um, Ms. Laguna for that. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, I see a hand raised with a, um, I did, with a telephone number. Uh, I'm not going to allow anyone from the public. This is a study session uh, for the commissioners. Do you recognize that number and do you know if it has an association with these, this applicant? Madam Chair, I'm not aware of this telephone number, but I did see somebody from a case that was coming up tonight. Um, hopefully, I don't know if Ms. Her Mrs. Hernandez is on the line with us, but did all the applicants for tonight, because we're now getting into when this um, hearing would typically happen, were, was everybody notified that uh, there's no quorum for tonight? Uh, the applicants have not been because we've not gotten to that part. So... Um, Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think because we've noticed it, we have to 
sort of stay on the line and let people know, at least staff will, is my understanding. Um, yes. So possibly that that is the, the case with this phone number. Okay, I think what we need to do, because it is 5.33 p.m., we're actually three minutes late in starting the public hearing. So what we're going to do is we are going to pause the study session. And Mr. McNeely, I would like to ask that you uh, put out a statement to all of the applicants that may be joining us this evening to explain what has happened and why there will not be a public hearing. Absolutely, thank you, Chairman Converse. Um, Zach, you could probably uh, unshare your, your screen now, thank you. Um, yes, thanks, uh, Chair Antiveros, uh, commissioners and members of the public. I'm Jess McNeely with the Community Development Department staff. And uh, unfortunately, our public hearing this evening scheduled for 5.30. Um, will not take place in that we do not have a quorum of planning and zoning commissioners. Um, we've had two commissioners who weren't able to make it. And with, with those two gone, uh, we do not have a quorum. So um, we, we cannot have the public hearing for the planning and zoning commission to make decisions this evening. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, we can continue on with this study session until the, uh, the, you and the commissioners are, um, are content with, uh, with completion of our study session. Um, if any members of the public would like to stay on for the study session, you are certainly welcome to stay listening for the study session. Uh, at the end of the study session, once we get through the, the established agenda for the study session, we will discuss when a makeup meeting uh, can be held um, uh, to make up for tonight's public hearing. Uh, we anticipate that that makeup meeting would be sometime next month um, to be discussed. Uh, if a makeup meeting is established for this, um, this hearing, uh, uh, you will receive official notice from our department letting you know when, when your public hearing item will be heard by the Planning and Zoning Commission. So uh, Madam Chair, maybe uh, we could probably take any, any questions um, just to clarify any of that. We haven't established when the when, when these items will go to public hearing, uh, but that's to be determined. All, all interested parties will get official notification of, um, of what that date will be. Uh, yes, and thank you for that, uh, Mr. McNeely. Out of respect for the applicants who have scheduled their time to be here this evening and have just learned that there will be no hearing, I would like to ask if there if anyone has any questions um, beyond what Mr. McNeely has put forth. If so, please raise your hand or unmute and I will call on you. And Ms. Laguna, I see you unmuted. Would you like to ask a question concerning this issue? No, I'm okay. sorry. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're fine. I just, I just didn't want to overlook you if you were on um, the public hearing agenda this evening. Okay, uh, Mr. McNeely, I am not seeing any unmutes or hands raised. Well, hold on a minute. Uh, Richard, you are uh, unmuted. Yes, Richard, go ahead and, and uh, address staff, please. Hello, uh, good evening. Thanks everyone. Uh, it's Richard Stronson here with Under Canvas. Um, our, some of our um, some of this, this hearing information is quite important in our time sensitive activities. Uh, obviously, it'd be greatest benefit for, for us to hear have a hearing fairly quickly. Is it likely to be any sooner than a month, or is a month the sort of the time frame that we think is is going to be the case? So, Madam Chair, I, I can respond to that um, because. Uh, our hearing several of our hearing items have to be advertised in newspapers and several of those newspapers are limited on on uh, how often they are published um, we are seeing that the soonest we can we can have a, another meeting is uh, is next month um, probably at the um, the earliest we could we could re-notice these and have another meeting would be in uh, the, the second to last or last week of October is the soonest is the soonest we could have um, 
a, uh, a, a makeup hearing. And the Planning and Zoning Commission has their regularly scheduled public hearing already scheduled for Wednesday, um, October 26th. So um, we will work out a hearing time. Uh, again, we apologize, but um, I, I would think that the, um, that the makeup hearing will certainly be sometime after October 20th um, and very likely the same week um, as, uh, as the scheduled, the regularly scheduled public hearing for October, which, which would be somewhere in the week of, um, the 24th of October 26th. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you, Richard. Um, with that, I am not seeing anyone unmuted or hands raised. So, Mr. McNeely, if you would please uh, move forward with the study session to the next item on that agenda. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, next case, Bob has, thanks for sharing your screen, Bob. Uh, that would be a conditional use permit, CUP 2283 for forest product processing, and the location is in Red Lake. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, Mr. Short, I think you might be muted because we can't hear you. Yep, Bob, you're you're muted. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, so the request in this case is for force products processing for both the sawmill and firewood processing. You, uh, commissioners saw this last uh, month as well. And this is the location of the property. It's in Red Lake, the Red Lake area. And this is a aerial photo showing the property. Uh, most of the, the processing is, is taking place, has been taking place. This was a code compliance issue over here where there's a sawmill and there's, a, uh, and there's some uh, processing of firewood. And this is the site plan that shows that. This is where the sawmill is right here. And we, like I said, we talked about this last month, it's a 10 acre property. Uh, and just to get back to you on, on things that we've looked at, the applicant did obtain an estimate from a professional sound company, uh, but does not wish to complete the study because of the cost. So the cost came in, it was, it, it was pretty expensive according to the applicant. And he didn't wish to do that, go through with that process. Uh, we have not required these studies before. In fact, we, you know, that was the biggest issue. And we have had, you know, helicopter pads where staff has gone out with a noise meter and checked the noise levels. So staff doesn't see that as being required. In fact, staff can go out uh, when we do our site visit and check the sound at that point. Um, at that point, the applicant would need, if there is more sound than is normal, normally the commission has approved or required that a level of 50 decibels at the property line was, was the correct level. Uh, staff is, is thinking it's gonna be more than that because this is a sawmill about 30 feet from the property line. So we would go out and have them put on a, you know, put on a log have them turn it up to full blast and see what kind of decibel reading we'd get at, at that property line. And the same for also a log splitting uh, machine that is also there and, and, and appears to make a similar sound. So at that point, we would need some kind of proposal from the applicant to mitigate the, any high noise levels. So we would make sure and do that before we move this case forward. Um, staff's position at this point is that they're going to need to put it inside some kind of a building. And uh, I think that it's important that they show that I can't see anything else, any kind of walls or anything else. Uh, being able to mitigate sounds if they are, in fact, at 100 decibels. And with that, I'll take any questions from the commission. Yeah, um, yeah Bob. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was uh, <clears throat> going to offer a little bit of uh, 
technical capability here. I have sound measurement equipment uh, that I've had for quite some time and have done uh, some level of sound work on my own. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I think it would be useful if um, you could let me know when you're going to post this or if the applicant has a time even prior to that, that uh, we could just take some sound readings. And I'm going to tell you, I suspect that based on the numbers he uh, gave us the last time around, that his own readings are probably going to be pretty close to what uh, we'll see uh, and what I would see with my sound level meter. Beyond that, um, it's, well, it's up to the distance he is from the property line with a given level of sound, of course, uh, and uh, then the distance to um, neighbors on other properties. It's a pretty straightforward calculation to see what those numbers look like, but they would only be guesstimates. Well, pretty reliable estimates, I would say, and uh, numbers that you could use to evaluate um, what we go forward with in either denying or granting a permit with conditions that would work for him. So um, that being said, I, I think that uh, is, I hope that's something you'd like to hear. Well, Commissioner Ruggles, that's, that sounds great. If you have some equipment, we could certainly go out to the site and, and do some tests and just to get some clear numbers. I have probably, I think I have an app on my phone, but it's probably not as good as uh, uh, equipment. Well, Actually, uh, I've done a little research into how good those uh, apps are for phones, and they're surprisingly good. Uh, the, the only question that remains is there are standards for doing the sound measurements, and that's the, that's the place where you can uh, get into a little bit of trouble in getting uh, reasonably accurate readings, and uh, that I can help you with uh, also. That sounds good, because then we can use the next we could document the type of instrument used. All right. That, that and the standard that uh, was used in uh, making the measurements also. Yep, sounds good. Uh, okay. I mean, Mr. Ruggles. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Commissioner Ruggles. Um, that is a huge help. Uh, Commissioner Best, your hand is raised. But now, thank you. There you, thank go. you. Uh, um, yeah, question about access here. I think I brought this up last time. Uh, looks like Buck Mountain Road is a county maintained road. Is that correct? I haven't looked at that yet, Comm uh, Commissioner Best. Okay. In any, in any case, uh, they seem to be going down an access easement, which uh, according to the map anyway, seems to be, uh, it looks like the property line bisects the easement. Um, so the question would be, is this easement appropriate for commercial use? And um, I don't know if we have neighbor input yet, but um, there might be an issue with uh, both legal and, and common sense use of an easement across residential property for commercial use. So that would be an issue. Thank you. Yep, Mr. Best, that's correct. We will take a look at that and uh, make sure that it's appropriate for commercial use. Okay, uh, thank you. Are there any other questions for staff at this time? Okay. Not seeing any, uh, Mr. McNeely, let's go ahead and advance to the next case. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Bob has the next case as well. It is uh, subdivisions SUB 2237. It's a preliminary plat amendment to modify conditions in, um, in the Ranch of the Peak subdivision regarding paving of Roundtree Road and a and a trail um, as planned in the subdivision. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, thanks, Jess. Thank you, Jess and Madam Chair. Okay, this case is uh, Ranch at the Peaks. It's a preliminary plat amendment or modification to the conditions of preliminary plat. 
And this is the request. Uh, commissioners of it a while have seen this before. Uh, it is to modify condition number seven to remove the requirement to pave Roundtree Road and also remove condition 18 that requires construction of a trail along the western boundary of the subdivision. And that is for the Ranch at the Peak subdivision. This is the location. It is on Highway 180 as it goes through Fort Valley. This is Fort Valley. So you can see some of the, um, actually you can see all three, Ranch at the Peaks Phase 1, Phase 2, and Phase 3. Uh, which have all been final platted at this point, and we'll talk about that more. This is the preliminary plat. Um, south is actually to the left, and north is to the right. And uh, and I did, let me back up here just one second. I did want to show you that Roundtree Road is located over here on this side. There was a condition in the original subdivision that they had to pave that. It's been difficult to make a connection back with why typically you wouldn't pave, you would be required to pave a road that's off site like this. I think originally uh, this, the road here that you see, Chimney Springs Road, which is now paved and provides access to, to Ranch at the Peak subdivision, uh, wasn't there and uh, they they put that in to provide access. So this is put to provide the main access in. Uh, so they wanted to have it paved. And it's kind of been sitting there ever since because it's it's difficult. You know, it's expensive to pave a road like this. Uh, so it, it's kind of been an issue for uh, for the applicant. Anyway, so this is preliminary plat. And I also wanted to show on the preliminary plat that there, there's a 50 foot wide trail and open space easement around the edge of the subdivision at the back of all of the properties. So that open space easement and trail easement actually remain in place, but the applicant would like to remove the requirement to actually put in the trail. Uh, and the, that requirement's already been, been removed from the east eastern side of the subdivision. So some background, Ranch of the Peaks was originally approved in 2006. That's a preliminary plat. At this point, all three final plat phases have been approved uh, and the, both the trail and Roundtree Road have been bonded for. So the applicant has paid the bond and they just recently got uh, that phase three approved, final plat approved, and that was on September 13th of this year. So those things have happened. So if they can get this approved, then they can they can uh, reclaim their bond. And as I said, the requirement to build a trail on the east side was removed in 2016. So here's the uh, kind of the here's this is the, something that's different in this particular case. Uh, first of all. Most of the, almost all the property owners, I, I, I did get a list, but I haven't confirmed everything yet, but the property owners of Ranch at the Peaks uh, are objecting. They provided a letter objecting to the trail. So they don't want the trail in their backyard. Basically, it goes in all of the backyards and uh, the property owners have rejected that. It is a private trail as well. So it's not open to the public. So these are the actual property owners that would use the trail and they're asking, they're objecting to it. They're asking that that be removed. In terms of Roundtree Road, we, staff has had a recent discussion with the Forest Service. In fact, the director and I met them out on site on Roundtree Road and a representative from the Forest Service let us know that they will not provide an easement for Roundtree Road which pretty much, much makes it impossible to pave a road if the Forest Service doesn't provide an easement for that. They will not support any kind of paving of Roundtree Road. So with that, I'll take any questions from the commission. Um, thank you, Mr. Short. And I am not seeing any hands raised or unmuted. For, uh, no, Commissioner Pels, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, I haven't been able to pull up that any maps in the last few minutes, but uh, 
without that perimeter trail, are there other trails in the subdivision? Is there forest access? What is, could you bring that map up and show us uh, what trails there would be without that perimeter trail, which I understand if, why the homeowners uh, might not appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Best, there aren't any other trails, but what the advocates say, I don't know if you've been out to uh, Ranch at the Peaks, but you know, it's a, uh, it's a pretty lightly traveled, you know, the streets out there aren't very busy. So what they're what they like to do is just walk around the circle right here that you see. So they just walk around on the road and that's what they seem to prefer to do rather than have, you know, people in their backyards, you know, walking by their houses. So yeah. um, that's what they have said. We already have a road. We don't need a trail. Is there forest access? Forest access. Yes. Uh, if you go, let me see. This this map's awkward because you know to the right is north. Yeah. So like this is corner. Yeah, yeah, this is Taylor Springs Road up here. This mm -hmm. is in phase three that's just been final platted. This is Taylor Springs Road. It comes this way and connects with Roundtree Road. And round mm -hmm. this is Forest Service right here. So you could just go right through here, get on Taylor Springs, and once you get on Roundtree Road, you're in the forest all the way down to the highway, which is down here. So there's uh, there's force access in that sense. I don't know about any, uh, a lot of trails out there, but um, there is definitely forest access. And really, the perimeter trail is actually kind of in two people's backyards, legally on one person's, but it's also on the backyards of the adjacent private parcels. Exactly right. People outside the subdivision. I don't think they were that happy about it either. So yeah. uh, all the all of these on both sides so it's a private trail but it's in two people's backyard and yeah, it's so there's not, no it's loss a, to the public here at all right it's not a public accessible trail it's a private trail it's a private yeah. easement well that's a good lesson for the future thanks very much thank you commissioner best any other questions from commissioners uh, Mr. Short, I'm not seeing any. So, uh, Mr. McNeely, let's go ahead and move to the next item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the next item on your study session agenda is CUP 2285. That's a conditional use permit for an RV as a residence in the AR zone. It's in the Grand Canyon Junction area. And Kelly is managing this case. So go ahead, Kelly. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Uh, good evening, Madam Commissioner. Um, I'm sorry, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, let me just put this in presentation mode for you. Can everyone see this okay? See you great. Yeah, they sure can. Perfect. Um, 2285 is a request for an RV as a permanent residence. Uh, you've actually seen this applicant before just a few months ago. Uh, they requested an RV as permanent residence on an adjacent parcel. Here you can see the overhead view um, and you can also see their site plan right next to this. Uh, so you can see that the RV is just going to go in the center of their property. This is in the valley area. Um, they intend to just use it seasonally. Uh, it's licensed and registered with no modifications per their narrative. Uh, they intend to use solar for most energy and propane for cooking. Uh, and they're going to get their water and dump their waste at Raptor Ranch. Um, and as I mentioned before, this applicant has had a very similar application previously. So staff will be checking conformance with our zoning ordinance impact on neighboring properties. And as you saw before, there's really not too many other properties nearby that are developed uh, with single family homes. And we'll also be checking the viability of their utilities. Um, are there any questions or comments on this one? I'm not seeing any Miss Bingham. So uh, Mr. McNeely, let's go ahead and move forward. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Kelly has the next one also. 
It is CUP 2298. Also a conditional use permit for a RV as permanent residence in the AR zone. Uh, go ahead, Kelly. Thank you again, Mr. McNeely. Um, and as he mentioned, this is an RV as a permanent residence in the AR zone. Uh, you can see in the aerial photo, this is in the Red Lake area just off Highway 64. Uh, this is a little more zoomed out, but you can see the property over here in the corner. And I put this next to their site plan as well. Um, and again, this is well within the setbacks. Uh, they're going to be putting in a 40 foot fifth wheel. Um, and this is intended to be used as a permanent residence. Uh, they had wanted to build on this parcel, but given the current material availability and the cost of building, they would like to do an RV as a permanent residence instead. Uh, they have already pulled some septic permits and they intend to have a full septic system uh, with which to handle their waste. And they also intend to get power from APS, uh, just as you would for a, a residential home from my understanding. Uh, with the lines buried. Some things that staff will be looking at on this one is conformance with our zoning ordinance, impact on neighboring properties, uh, and we'll also be checking the utility viability, uh, just as with our last case. Uh, for this one, we'll also be checking to make sure that the uh, vehicle is licensed and operable. Um, and with that, are, are there any other questions from the commission? Okay, and I'm not seeing any, Ms. Bingham. So, uh, Mr. McNeely, please move to the Community Development Department update. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Antiveros. Um, so, on our, uh, on our update, we did want to let you know that the Board of Supervisors held a hybrid meeting uh, at their September 13th public hearing. Um, it actually didn't go that well. Uh, and there was a continuation of one of the cases that had been to you recently um, because it, it didn't go very well. So um, county manager staff and, and people who work in the, in the admin building are re-looking at that, re-looking that. Um, I believe we are scheduled to have a, uh, a hybrid meeting. Well, we are having a board of supervisors hearing with them again on October 11th would be our next one. And um, I believe the intent is to do that as a hybrid again, um, so we can report back to you on how that, um, how that hybrid meeting goes um, with anticipation that the commission could uh, in the future hold hybrid meetings as well. Um, any questions on, on that item? I'm not seeing any, Mr. McNeely, so we'll stay tuned for updates on that. Uh, go ahead and bump forward. Okay. Uh, second item, the uh, DPTF, Donny Park, Timberline, Fernwood area plan um, uh, will be processed as a major amendment to the comprehensive plan. I uh, wanted to let you know, as, as you all know, it's on your, on your public hearing agenda um, for, for the October public hearing agenda, as, uh, as Melissa Shaw gave you the study session this evening but it is currently scheduled um, for, uh, for public hearing with you guys October 26th. We just wanted to re-hit that as well. And I believe we anticipate that it will go to the Board of Supervisors on December 13th, if, if it continues on the path that we anticipate um, for, uh, for the public hearing schedule. So just wanted to give you those dates um, pretty important, uh, pretty important planning item here that um, your public hearing on October 26th, and then we anticipate that uh, December 13th would be when it would go to the Board of Supervisors. I see that Commissioner Best has his hand up. Any questions? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about uh, that meeting at the end of the month. We've got uh, seven cases that we just looked at that yep. might end up in that same meeting. And I, I haven't seen, I haven't reviewed the area plan. I, I don't know, I mean, it's 150 pages long. And uh, so my direct question is, um, or my direct thought is that it might be better to have two meetings, even if they're in the same week, or at least think about, uh, the load that evening if we combine everything. You know, we don't want to go till two in the morning. 
Absolutely. Um, thank you, Commissioner Best. Great minds think alike. Uh, staff uh, in in our meeting that we did immediately um, preceding this study session discussed the exact same thing. We've got a recommendation for a second meeting that week. So maybe when we wrap up the rest of this study session agenda, that was the next thing that we were going to jump into under our uh, roundtable is um, what could work as as a to hold two meetings uh, during the week of your typical October um, hearing. Right. Uh, I know the commissioners can use the overtime, so we'll look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I I think we're all laughing hard right now. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, uh, Mr. McNeely. Okay, any other questions on item two on the um, DPTF area plan updating? All right, uh, um, Commissioner Best, I see your hand's still up. I'm assuming that uh, we already answered the question, or did you have another one? It's a personal problem. I just can't get that, but I'll keep working on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, third item here. Um, as you all know, you get an update every month. Uh, the county is a partner on the Route 66 Brownfield EPA grant. Uh, of course, it's managed by NACOG, and Melissa has been working directly with them. Um, so we always just like to throw on our study session uh, agenda um, as a kind of a public service announcement. If anyone, uh, including anyone from the public, um, who's listening is aware of a potential brownfields project on property, um, please contact Melissa. Any questions on that one? All right. Well, the next item, Madam Chair, uh, item four, we're continuing to work with the City of Flagstaff on the regional plan update. Um, there are a lot of neighborhood meetings being scheduled. Um, as a matter of fact, we've, uh, there was one last Saturday, uh, Melissa assisted with that one. Um, there's another one this Saturday, 10, 10 a.m. at City Hall, um, and I'll be participating in that one this Saturday. So um, again, if you have any questions on the regional plan update, you can always contact Melissa and, um, and get a status on that. All right, well, Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. Item five, uh, we will uh, we will initiate and, and Melissa will be uh, managing the project to update the comprehensive plan and uh, starting in calendar year 23. Um, we, uh, we're gonna start working on the 10 year update. The comprehensive plan was last updated in 2015. So in 23, we'll start uh, what we would anticipate be about a two year process to update the comprehensive plan um, in time to adopt it in 25. Um, in preparation for that, um, Melissa it will be working on the comprehensive plan implementation report um, that we've done periodically over the past few years. Any questions on the comprehensive plan implementation report, which you will be getting prior to, uh, prior to going to the board, um, or the update of the comprehensive plan that we intend to initiate uh, in the new calendar year. Mr. McNeely, I'm not seeing any, so uh, go ahead and go to Board of Supervisors update. Okay, well, um, we already hit, hit on this a little bit when we talked about the board's hybrid meeting, but zone change 2204, the windmill ranch zone change will go to the Board of Supervisors on October 11th. We anticipate at this point in time that that's, that will be a hybrid meeting. Um, so we would certainly um, encourage you all to, uh, to attend or observe um, if you're interested uh, in that case. Any questions on that Board of Supervisors public hearing? Comm Commissioner Bass, go ahead. Um, I, I'd like to go back to the previous one if there are no questions on this one. Uh, no, that's fine. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Bess. I just want to make sure that all the commissioners are on the email list for the regional plan uh, because there are opportunities now to go to meetings and have input into it and learn about it. Uh, you know, Everyone may not be interested, but everyone should have the opportunity to do that. They're having uh, open houses at various places around uh, the regional plan boundaries. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Best. Yeah, and if anyone is not getting those emails and would like to, 
Uh, I could actually, I could prompt Melissa as well. Um, if all of the commissioners are not already on that email list, I think I could get you guys on it. Um, thank you, Commissioner Best, and thank you, Mr. McNeely. I'm not on it, but I um, am going to have to agree with Commissioner Best that even if we can't attend, I think it would help us to stay engaged and know what is going on. So uh, yeah, I think it would be a good idea to get the commissioners on that list. Okay, will do. All right, and now we are at commission and staff roundtable. And uh, Mr. McNeely, your comment with uh, Commissioner Best on great minds think alike. Um, I was looking at the clock right now. It is 6.09. Yes. That means the study session, okay, study session went two hours and we have had no public input. And I can see looking at what is coming that there could be, there could be some interested public and I'm thinking that we might have some late nights. So I was also going down that road and I'm very interested to see uh, what staff has come up with for um, suggestions on getting these two agendas, the one that we should have had last night, or excuse me, tonight, and the cases that we will have next month. Absolutely. So Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, when we look at the calendar and staff's capacity, considering um, other meetings and other hearings um, and you all's capacity, and in order for us to meet the noticing deadlines, our, rec our first recommendation would be back-to-back -back nights and do it on uh, hold the makeup for tonight's public hearing on Tuesday, October 25th. And then the very next day, you would have your regularly scheduled um, hearing for um, on Wednesday, October 26th. The, the, the second alternative we would give um, to that recommendation would be uh, flipping to the day after the Wednesday, Wednesday, October 26th, and have the makeup meeting for this hearing on Thursday, October 27th. We wanted to at least give a couple options um, so we could work towards uh, having a quorum since that, since that was obviously an issue this evening. So we'd start with you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess we would see among the commissioners present uh, which one works best for them. And, okay, uh, and me, you either me, not work at all. Um, okay, let me ask this. What time would it be? Would it be the usual 5.30? Thank you very much for asking that. Again, great minds think alike. Um, staff did discuss that because the makeup meeting will not need to have a study session, that we could start, we could um, notice and hold the public hearing starting at 4 p.m. Okay, um, as okay, as for me, but I wanna go through every other commissioner. Um, I could do, I could do either. Um, I could do either. So if okay. there is one that works better for everybody, I will adjust my schedule to accommodate that. So. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, um, Commissioner Best, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm sorry, I was distracted. Can you give me those dates again? Uh, the, the preferred option for staff is Tuesday, October 25th. Um, the other, the second uh, less preferred option would be Thursday, October 27th. And of course, uh, in the middle there, Wednesday, October 26th is your um, is your regular scheduled hearing. And Com Commissioner Best, the one on Tuesday or Thursday, basically the, the kind of makeup meetings, because there is no uh, study session. Uh, there would be the meeting would start at four o'clock p.m. rather than 530, if that makes a difference. Um, I could do either night. I'm a little concerned about four o'clock because uh, people work and uh, there, are, there are some cases here where people might want to attend and would not be able to because they got to work. So I don't know if that's an overriding consideration, but it is a consideration. But I could make, uh, at this point, I could make either of those. 
Um, Mr. McNeely and, and, and Commissioner Best, I understand your concern. Um, if you were to look at the agenda that we should have heard tonight and the one that we will be hearing next month, um, do you think, because usually I've got a pretty good take on, you know, how big the public interest would be. Do you think it would be possible to say, okay, this one would have more public interest, this one would have more public interest, and we could kind of section it off like that and have the ones that we probably didn't see having a large public interest starting it for? I think I, that's just a good idea. Staff could probably figure that, that out. Certainly yeah. the, the noisy lumber mill. Uh, I would think the neighbors would want a piece of that action. And uh, I think staff could figure it out, but I would just take that into consideration. Our, our certainly our recommendation just for consistency um, would be that the makeup meeting um, started start at 4 p.m. because uh, and that the one already scheduled for the 26th um, go as planned. Um, just for consistency right. with those applicants, so we're not we're not uh, tripping up more people. Um, I would point out that the that the public hearing um, that we're um, that we're not having tonight um, uh, does um, yeah doesn't have doesn't have a, as much probably as much need for public input. As the items um, uh, that are on on the regular scheduled hearing for October, um, so I think if if the one if it you know it and it just is happenstance, but I, I think that the agenda that you should have heard tonight, if that went at 4 p.m. say on Tuesday, October 25th, um, we have less interested, uh, fewer interested citizens in in that agenda than I believe we will have in the regularly scheduled, uh, which will go uh, ne for next month, which will go on October uh, 26th at 5.30 p.m. Yeah, that, that right. seems to make sense to me as well. Yeah. I, yeah. So. And there's only, there would only be three hearings because one of them tonight was going to be continued to next month anyway. So right. that would only be a three hearing agenda meeting. So, right. okay. Um, Commissioner Burton, yeah, I, obviously, I don't want anyone making any decisions around me, but um, it, it's difficult for me to take off early two days in a row at work. So that's going to be my challenge is I probably wouldn't be able to make the four. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Now, that's, now that's not to say I wouldn't be able to come in later, but I mean, normally I'm off at four and obviously it's going to take me 20 minutes to get home. So I may not get on till 430. So that's that's my challenge is that like like commissioner best said people work <laughs> and i already take off early to make sure that i'm on time for the the one meeting a month so okay and it is possible that that might be if if we had everyone accept you we would still have a quorum and you could actually join us at 4 30. i'm just i'm just throwing that out there mr mcneely sure. is into the mix of things okay Absolutely. And maybe if we're at risk of not having a quorum without um, Commissioner Burton, then we just schedule it for 430. Right, right. And um, Commissioner Burton, is 430 a pretty good safe time? Like oh, yeah, that's a, that's a safe time for me. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Commissioner Clifford? Um, I am traveling back to Flagstaff on the 25th and I would not be able to make, a, I don't think I'd even be able to make a 5.30 meeting. Okay, how about the 27th? 27th, I'm open. Okay, then let's go back up and start with Commissioner Best. Are you open on the 27th? And Commissioner Burton, are you open on the 27th at 4.30? I'm, I'm open either Tuesday or Thursday um, is it's like I said, it's just the taking off work early part for me. <clears throat> okay. okay. And I, and, I'm, and, I'm open uh, all three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. And Mr. McNeely, it is possible 
that we could still have the meeting at 4.30 on Tuesday if no one was absent except Commissioner Clifford. So sure. that's still a possibility. Uh, okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Ruggles. I've got to ask everybody to ignore the phone that's in the background. I can't shut the thing off where I'm working from. <laughs> it's okay. So, in it's any okay. event, uh, whatever day and whatever time works for everyone else will also work for me without any any discussion necessary. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. You bet. Uh, Mr. McNeely, did we did we answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you, Chair Ontiverse. Um, uh, I have um, either works um, for everyone except for Commissioner Clifford. Um, he would not be able to make it uh, most likely on the 25th. He could make it on the 27th. Um, right. We can take this and, uh, and try to reach out to, um, I believe um, Commissioner Williams may not be available to get a hold of. I think, I think we can get a response um uh from uh from don so okay. um, we'll reach out to them and we will um we will give you a final decision here as as soon as we can get that out because we're gonna have to get the the advertising right. moving on these cases right right okay um i think that that sounds like a good plan um we're still at um we're still at commission roundtable. Do any other commissioners have any other items or concerns, questions, things you want to talk about? All right, Mr. McNeely, I'm not seeing any, so um, I think we're done for the evening. Thank you very much, and thank you, commissioners, and thank you, staff, um, for being here this evening. And I'd like to thank all the, uh, or I'd just like to express that I'm glad to be back with y'all and I missed you for a year, but um, mm -hmm. right back in the swing of things. Yeah. All right. Keep keep up with that good uh, food truck research, Jess, and let us know any updates on that. I will. <laughs> all right. Okay. All I want to do is say uh, welcome back, Jess. Uh, your uh, abilities are greatly appreciated. So oh, thank you. It, it's, it's a great team. So. <laughs> So, and you guys are part of it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, welcome back, Ray. Appreciate you being back here, uh, helping us all out. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Keep, keeping us on yeah. the right track. Yeah, yeah. I, and I underscore and echo that. So, all right. Good night, everybody. Uh, we will see you. We'll get to see each other a couple of times in October, maybe even hybrid. Who knows? Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Can't wait. I know. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Hey, Marty, you still on? I am. <laughs> I thought I'd catch you before you go off. Yeah. Um, I tend to wait till everybody's off so I can just end the meeting and the recording. And Oh, you can stop recording then. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I can now. <laughs> yeah. I stop recording. Um, but...